Thank you so much for the kind introduction, and it is such a delight to be back here at Sloan, where it all began for so many of us, to talk about something that I've worked on in many different forms for many years. So about a month and a half ago, the world was shocked and amazed when Elon Musk announced that he was going to acquire Twitter for $44 billion. And then we were all equally stunned when he announced that the deal was going to be placed on hold because of concern around bots and how much fake activity there was on Twitter. So what exactly is the concern? What can Twitter bots do? Well, fundamentally, they can accelerate the spread of information. But it's specific types of information that we're most concerned about being spread too rapidly. Here's a framework from First Draft News that talks about some of these forms of bad information that we're concerned about. And I want to make a distinction here between some terms that you might have heard conflated in the past, specifically misinformation and disinformation. So as you can see here, there are very different meanings that are associated with misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation. There's just bad information out there that can hurt someone that isn't necessarily spread with any sort of intent that is actually accurate, and that's what malinformation is. Misinformation, on the other hand, is just when something which is incorrect is spread, but it might be spread inadvertently without any intent to do harm. But what we're most interested in is disinformation. When you have information which is both inaccurate and spread with malicious intent, and that's exactly what the concern is around fake activity on Twitter in particular, but all social networks in general. How can this incorrect information be spread with this malicious intent? And Elon Musk himself is quite familiar with these sorts of happenings. So just recently, there was a scam where a deep fake was created and propagated on Twitter and other social networks that showed Elon Musk appearing to endorse a cryptocurrency trading platform, which of course he never did. So in 2022, how do we understand the difference between what is real and what is fake? Well, one of the things that we've done for many, many years is go to an authoritative source, like an encyclopedia. And for more than 15 years now, the definitive encyclopedia in the world has been Wikipedia. In fact, there was a study that was conducted in Nature many years ago that showed that when they looked at the details of various articles in Encyclopedia Britannica, then the leading encyclopedia at the time, and Wikipedia, that Wikipedia was just as accurate. And it's amazing how Wikipedia content can be generated with such a high level of accuracy and with such detail in a very short period of time by people collaborating all over the world. For example, take a look at this article about Emerson LaSalle. Now, how many of you have heard of the, the famous author uh, Emerson LaSalle? Well, this, this is a very smart group. You're probably at MIT because this is a fake article. And this was on Wikipedia for more than a year. Here's an article about a Civil War general with a tremendous amount of detail, including a picture of their monument. And that was on Wikipedia for more than 11 years before it was detected. And the fundamental problem here is that humans are very easy to fool. There's a principle called the Gell-Mann amnesia effect. It's named after Murray Gell-Mann, who was the 1969 Nobel Laureate in Physics, and it goes like this. When Murray would read an article in the newspaper about physics, he would very quickly get frustrated with all of the inaccuracies, all of the lack of thoroughness that the reporter put into that article, and he would conclude that they didn't know what they were talking about. But then he would turn the page and read an article about politics or business or sports or finance and automatically assume that that particular reporter knew exactly what they were talking about and would just accept all of those facts as though they were truth. And this is something that we all do on a pretty regular basis. We're experts in our own domains of expertise, but as soon as we step outside of that, we're subject to whatever mechanisms are available for us to be able to get facts in other areas. Now, by the way, one of my favorite things about the Gell-Mann amnesia effect is that it itself is an example of fooling humans because it has nothing to do with Murray Gell-Mann. It was created by Michael Crichton. 
And he inserted Murray Gell-Mann's name into it because he discussed it with him once and thought it would sound more important and official if it was called the Gell-Mann amnesia effect. So what are some of the effects of fooling humans around the world so easily? Well, today, YouGov uh, did a poll a while ago and found that only two-thirds of millennials in the United States are firmly convinced that the Earth is round. The rest are open to other points of view. <laughs> One of my favorite examples of this disinformation being spread is the idea that Australia does not exist. Th this was a Facebook post that was shared more than 20,000 times just on Facebook alone. And it consists of just pure text that is aiming to mislead people. Australia does not exist. All things you call proof are actually well-fabricated lies and documents made by the leading governments of the world. Your Australian friends, they're all actors and computer-generated personas, part of the plot to trick the world. So you might look at this with a skeptical eye and think, well, hold on a second, what about if I've actually been to Australia? <laughs> what about the people who have visited there? Well, the author thought of that as well. If you think you've ever been to Australia, you're terribly wrong. <laughs> the plane pilots are all in on this and have in all actuality only flown you to the islands close nearby, or in some cases, parts of South America, where they have cleared space and hired actors to act out as real Australians. And this resulted in a tremendous amount of media coverage, further propagating this disinformation and misleading people. As Winston Churchill said, a lie gets halfway around the world before the truth has a chance to get its pants on. And one of the things I love the most about this quote from Churchill is that Churchill never actually said it. <laughs> Even though there are tens of thousands of people on the internet that are convinced that he did say it. But just because the quote itself is false doesn't mean that there isn't truth to it. In fact, at Sloan, research was conducted by Sinan Aral working with other professors, and they found that falsehoods are 70% more likely to be retweeted on Twitter than the truth, and they spread much faster than the real information. So Churchill's intuition was absolutely right about this, and we now have the data to be able to back that up. So how exactly are deceptive content and disinformation created these days? How can they be created with tremendous levels of realism? Well, deep fakes and other forms of fraudulent content are what we're talking about from a technology perspective. In order to be able to understand some of these mechanisms, we have to back up to the dawn of the age of AI when Alan Turing proposed the idea of the Turing test in 1950 in his seminal paper. And the idea of the Turing test, which uh, I'm guessing many of you have heard of, is whether or not it's possible for a computer system to become so powerful that it would be able to take the place of humans in various forms of activity in order to be able to fool other humans. If it could be so powerful that we wouldn't be able to tell the difference as human beings ourselves. Now, when this idea was brought up, technology was, of course, in a much earlier state. And even decades later, there was a tremendous amount of skepticism about whether or not this was even a useful concept. There's this great uh, article that was written in The Economist in 1992 saying that, you know, Turing may be right. We may actually get to the point where we're going to be able to pass the Turing test. But what's the point of that? We already have human beings, and I love this, that you know, should a shortage arise, there are proven and popular methods for making more of them. <laughs> but of course, there is an application for fooling human beings. Fooling human beings is an incredibly powerful way to be able to use artificial intelligence, and we're already seeing examples of the Turing test being passed in very restricted circumstances. This brings us to fake videos and deep fakes. So you might have seen some of the early examples of deep fakes about five plus years ago doing amusing things like inserting Nicolas Cage's face into different movies. And th this was a curiosity and it was amusing, but it wasn't particularly dangerous and it wasn't particularly convincing. No nobody would look at uh, this image and think that Nicolas Cage was really in that movie. And in fact, there was a tremendous amount of talent required 
to be able to get this right. R reporters and other folks who were experimenting with this technology discovered that they could produce results that looked okay, but not particularly good. A few years ago, a Tom Cruise impersonator named Miles Fisher teamed up with a very talented visual artist named Chris Ume, and he was able to produce a set of videos that were uncanny in terms of not only their resolution, but also to be able to get Tom Cruise's mannerisms down, to be able to get all of the different facial tics that a person has when they're really being video uh, recorded the, themselves to get that accurate. And that was something that caught a lot of people's attention because now all of a sudden you could use this technology and create something that would definitely fool a lot of people if they didn't know that a video was synthetic. So based on what you've seen and what you've heard so far, how many of you show of hands would say that deep fakes today are as good as visual effects from Hollywood? Maybe about 20% uh, of you would say that. So let's take a look. I don't think it's a spoiler to say that Luke Skywalker made a reappearance in The Mandalorian. <laughs> or if it is, then you, know, you need to catch up. And <laughs> people were amazed to be able to see the younger version of Mark Hamill rendered here. But there were a lot of folks that were dissatisfied with his appearance. It kind of uh, entered into the stage of what we call the uncanny valley, where it looked like it was a human being, or it looked like it was realistically rendered, but there was something off-putting about it that wasn't quite 100% realistic. And so a visual effects artist used deep fake technology and in four days came up with a version of that same video that everyone thought looked a lot better. So what was Hollywood's response to this? What did Lucasfilm do? Well, they hired him. <laughs> so in fact, what we can see is that with talent, with skill, and with time, deepfake technology can actually exceed what was possible in terms of realism with the previous approach to Hollywood visual effects. So that's kind of a stunning revelation for a lot of folks. And what we can see now in terms of the harms of these technology is that there is a tremendous uh, proliferation of videos that are created using deepfake technology and you can find tens of thousands of examples just of deep fakes relating to Joe Biden and other political figures. But of course, we don't even really need such advanced technology to be able to mislead people. One of the most famous misleading videos from the past few years was a video of Nancy Pelosi that appeared to show her slurring her speech. And there was no advanced technology required to create this at all. This is video editing capabilities that have been available since the 1950s. And yet, that was enough to make people think that the video was potentially authentic, and it was forwarded millions of times on social media platforms. There are other types of deep fakes as well. You can create deep fake images, audio, and text. There's an app that uh, rocketed in popularity a few years ago called FaceApp that allows you to retouch your own photos. So you can upload your photos and see uh, what you would look like with different lighting, what you would look like uh, at a different age or with different facial hair. You can use it to answer questions such as, what if Daniel Craig continued to play James Bond? <laughs> or what, what will Tom Holland look like when Marvel finally lets him out of his Spider-Man contract? You can also use this technology, and the tech technology itself is called generative adversarial networks. That's what's used to be able to create these types of deep fakes, to be able to synthesize faces from whole cloth. So if you go to the website thispersondoesnotexist.com, it uses this technology to be able to create faces of people who simply don't exist at all. You can also use the technology to be able to mimic people's voices. And this has been used by cyber criminals in a number of different cases already, and this is something that we expect to proliferate over the years. A few years ago, there was an AI model that was created to be able to generate text, and it was able to generate text that was so realistic, it was kind of scary, the speeches that it could generate that sounded like they came from real UN officials. OpenAI an organization that conducts various types of AI research, 
created a new language model and they said that it was so dangerous that they were concerned about releasing it to the public. And then they released it to the public. <laughs> and everyone was amazed at its capabilities. So what this language model is capable of doing is taking any sample of speech and extrapolating from it. You can give it various forms of directives and configurations, and it can generate text that's going to be realistic in a variety of different domains. So the Guardian used this to be able to create an entire article, and it gave GPT-3 the mission of writing an article about how robots come in peace and are not a threat to humanity. And when you look at the text of the article, you can see that it's writing in coherent sentences. It's writing almost with a specific style, much the same way that a human author would. Here's a website that was created combining some of these technologies. So taking images generated by thispersondoesnotexist.com and using a language model to be able to generate text, now we don't need folks in marketing anymore. We can just generate these blogs automatically. And you can see that it's actually talking about something that sort of makes you scratch your head and ask, maybe Google is adding uh, a third headline to uh, its text ads. This happened to me as well. And this is an example of completely unsophisticated text generation technology. The article on the left is an op-ed that I wrote. And within a few hours of it being posted on VentureBeat, the article on the right appeared on another website and it replaced a number of the terms with unique terms so that they would come up on different search engine searches. And the reason that various individuals and organizations create bots and scripts like this is because they want to make money. So this article on the right had ads next to it. And whenever anyone would be misled and go to that site rather than VentureBeat, they would make money off of the ad impressions and off of the ad clicks. So how exactly does this deceptive content and disinformation get propagated? Well, this is where bots, fraud, and abuse come in. And bots is an overloaded term. People mean many different things when they talk about bots. There are poker bots that actually play better than most humans. And there are various uh, forums that ban the use of different types of gaming bots. There are ticketing bots that will buy up tickets before the real human beings who want to attend that particular event are able to purchase them. And some of the most sophisticated bots in the world are actually sneaker bots. And so this is an area where there's a very well-developed ecosystem with tutorials and training that's available for anyone that wants to use a bot to be able to buy up newly launched sneakers. And this is such a big problem that organizations as large as Nike have actually canceled the launch of very popular new sneaker brands because of concerns around bots buying up all of that inventory. One of the types of bots that I'm most familiar with in my work is click bots. So when I first joined Google, one of the first terms that I learned was mesothelioma. Some of you might know what that uh, means, but it's a rare form of asbestos-related cancer. And the reason that I had to learn that term was because it was the single most expensive keyword in our entire advertising network. So if you were running an ad for mesothelioma-related content, you could charge, uh, you, you had to pay, rather, $100 per click. And the reason that people were willing to pay this was because there were class action lawsuits going on at the time trying to find plaintiffs on their behalf, folks that had developed mesothelioma. And the class action lawyers were willing to pay $10,000 per plaintiff. So of course, it made sense for them to be willing to pay $100 a click. Now, translate that into Google's advertising and publishing model, and you realize that if you sign up for the AdSense network, and you've got a website where you can show mesothelioma ads, and then, most crucially, you can generate fake clicks on those ads, every single time, you're going to get a big chunk of that $100 per click. So what this resulted in was people being recruited in click farms around the world, especially in developing nations, where they would sit in front of a computer and click on ads all day. 
And of course, a better form of being able to do that is with bots. Being able to alleviate that human effort and use automation to be able to generate those fake clicks. And there are a variety of different click bots which were created. You can see the uh, differences in their user interfaces. The interfa user interface on the bottom left, I think, is particularly interesting because you basically just tell that bot, how much money would you like to make today? And it will take care of all the rest in terms of being able to generate the fake clicks. And of course, this was what we focused on from a technology perspective to be able to detect and protect against that. So there is a big difference when we're talking about bots versus when we're talking about fake versus when we're talking about spam. These are all terms that are conflated with one another. And that brings us back to Elon Musk and his concerns around Twitter because what we see in the headlines is a tremendous amount of this conflation where people are saying, how much activity is fake? How much activity are bots? And they're generally meaning the same thing, but they're meaning it in a very imprecise way. So if we look at the specific types of activity that we're actually interested in, what we see is that if we consider real, legitimate Twitter activity to be a single individual using a single account in a way that they announce, this is my account and this is my identity, there are many classes of behavior that deviate from that. There are bots that are undeclared. It's a Twitter account that appears to be a human being, but all of the content is algorithmically generated. There are bots that are actually announcing that they're a bot, and they're behaving in automated ways. And that's actually a form of activity that has been part of the Twitter ecosystem from the very beginning. And no one thinks of that as fake or misleading, but it is absolutely automated from a technology perspective. There are also role bots, like the, the bots that retweet the headlines for the New York Times on the New York Times main account. Nobody's objecting to those types of bots, and yet, do you want to include that in your count of fake activity? But then there are other forms of irregular accounts. There are impersonators, folks that have registered accounts, often in the name of a celebrity, and they're claiming to be that celebrity. And that's something that Twitter's trust and safety team looks at on a regular basis to try and discover and uh, remove. There are folks that transparently use multiple accounts. So the, the concern there is, how do you count the number of accounts and the number of users that are actually active on Twitter's system if people can have multiple accounts and it might be difficult for you to be able to tie those multiple accounts together. There are sock puppet and burner accounts where you've got uh, an individual who might have a main Twitter account that they use under their own name, but then there are many other accounts that they've registered in order to be able to respond to their critics or to be able to try and manipulate the public discourse in some way that isn't tied to their name. And this is something that uh, Kevin Durant famously did uh, to be able to respond to different folks on Twitter that were criticizing uh, uh, his performance in different games. There are also pseudonymous accounts. So, using a Twitter account, but not under your own name. And the most important category is mass registered accounts. And this is what uh, we're most concerned about from a scale perspective and a technology perspective, because this is when you've got individuals or organizations who are registering thousands or even millions of accounts en masse in order to use those accounts at some later point to either spread disinformation or amplify content or to basically use those accounts for resale purposes for whatever means uh, or uh, whatever uh, uh, aim they have. When you look at Facebook, they spend a tremendous amount of time and effort on discovering these mass registered accounts. And in fact, they released some statistics saying that they removed more than three billion fake accounts from their system in just the span of six months. That's more accounts than they have legitimately on their system that they're removing because of fake account registrations. And even still, they were removing large networks of fake accounts after they removed those 3 billion to the tune of 43 million plus. So you can consider those 43 million accounts that weren't caught in the first sweep. What happens with these accounts? They go onto marketplaces. The cyber criminal ecosystem is extremely federated and commoditized. We see one group of cyber criminals that concentrates on a particular area of expertise, and that might be mass registering social media accounts. 
But then there's another set of cyber criminals who actually utilizes those accounts to further different goals. And so these marketplaces are where those cyber criminals can meet, and they function much like legitimate marketplaces where you can find reviews of the sellers, you can leave feedback, you can get support, and basically do all of the things that are required to be able to support a business. Part of the problem here in terms of controlling accounts around the world and using them to propagate disinformation and uh, perpetuate other forms of deception is that stolen passwords have reached epidemic proportions. So think about the way you use the web yourself. How many passwords do you have to maintain on a regular basis? If, if you're like most users, it's probably numbering in the hundreds at this point. And it gets extremely frustrating to be able to pick a unique password for every single website, so you probably fall into some patterns. And in fact, what most users do is they reuse passwords constantly. The problem with doing this is that it creates a new type of risk that nobody ever thought about beforehand. Because of the giant data breaches that have occurred on websites over the course of the last decade, you now have stolen passwords from one site in the hands of cyber criminals who will use technology to be able to test those passwords on completely unrelated websites. So what that means is if you're using the same password for LinkedIn as you're using on Gmail, a cyber criminal can take the LinkedIn breach and use that password that they found to be able to test whether or not the same password works for that same email address on Gmail. Now imagine you're using the same password for your banking website. Imagine you're using the same password for your government access website. Imagine you're using it for your employer. This is what we call the attack surface of stolen passwords in the cybersecurity industry, and that attack surface has become vast. Here's an example of yet another very specialized form of cyber criminal tool. It's called Sentry MBA, and it looks like just a regular Windows application, but in fact, this is exclusively used for what we call credential stuffing attacks. That is, the act of taking stolen passwords from one website and testing them automatically using this bot framework against completely unrelated websites. And this allows cyber criminals to be able to take over tens of thousands of accounts in just the span of a few hours. What does this look like in the real world when we're talking about the sites that are being attacked? Here's some uh, data from my team at F5. And this shows what normal web traffic looks like over the span of a week. So if you haven't seen a lot of web traffic, let me uh, tell you what's going on here. Typically, when you're awake, you use the web more than when you're asleep. So what we can see here is that you have peaks of activity of, on every day of that week during the times when people tend to be using their computer, and then that dips down during the nighttime hours. Well, here's what the traffic looked like on one of the largest retailers in the United States. That's not a healthy pattern of traffic. That's weird. Why would the traffic look like that over the span of a week? Well, we put our technology in and analyzed what was going on, and what we discovered was that that pattern of normal web traffic was actually there, but it was a tiny sliver of the total traffic that that website was receiving on a 24-7 basis. The vast majority of the traffic, more than 92% of it, was coming from sustained credential stuffing attacks, cyber criminals taking your stolen passwords and testing them against the login form of this website to see if they could take over your account. And this is not an isolated case. This is something that we see in basically every single industry. We see this in retailers in the luxury segment. We see this in large airlines. We see this in hotels. Basically, any website that serves thousands or millions of consumers is subject to these types of attacks. So it's very, very important that you think about what your most valuable accounts are and don't reuse passwords across those websites. So you might think, well, isn't this why I have to prove that I'm a human every single time I log into a website to be able to protect against these kinds of bot attacks? And that's exactly what the idea of CAPTCHA was when it was invented. In fact, 
CAPTCHA harkens back to the dawn of artificial intelligence because it stands for completely automated public Turing test to tell computers and humans apart. So the idea was that we're going to administer a Turing test to figure out whether or not something is actually a bot. And this was a great idea when it was created. And now we spend a tremendous amount of time solving CAPTCHA around the world. And this is transformed into a variety of different shapes. One of my favorites is using heavy metal band logos as a CAPTCHA. <laughs> and the most common form of CAPTCHA that uh, is still used throughout the world today is what's called a synthetic distorted text challenge, the squiggly text that you have to read. Now, of course, one of the things that we know is that computers have gotten a lot better at being able to read distorted text. So Google was wondering about this and did some research a few years ago to discover exactly what the state of the art looked like in terms of solving these synthetic distorted text capture challenges. And what they discovered was that humans had dropped down to a 33% solve rate. <laughs> we were terrible at reading these. And they're getting more and more distorted over time. And we don't know what they're saying. But when you look at machine learning based optical character recognition technology, it had shot up to a 99.8% <laughs> solve rate. So this is very concerning because now CAPTCHAs are doing exactly the opposite of what they were intended to do. They're creating tremendous amounts of friction for the entire world of humans, but they're introducing no real barrier for cyber criminals. And in fact, they're getting worse and worse. If you're anything like me, you're even more confused by CAPTCHAs and spending more time solving them than ever before. <laughs> and now there are cyber criminal CAPTCHA solving services that will use optical character recognition, that will use machine learning, that will also use click farms of human beings in order to be able to provide CAPTCHA solving as a service to other cyber criminals that just need to be able to get past a CAPTCHA challenge in order for their bots to function. De Death by CAPTCHA advertises that they will solve 1,000 CAPTCHAs for $1.39, and they even have a discount for gold members. <laughs> so what happens when we take sophisticated disinformation and couple it with automated distribution? Well. We are evolving through different stages of disinformation automation right now. The first stage of this was the possibility of being able to create convincing content. So when you think about deep fake videos, the dawn of that was a few years ago when deep fake technology suddenly enabled very technical and very talented people with a fair amount of effort to be able to create an example of a deep fake video that would fool not everyone, but it would probably fool a lot of people. But we've actually evolved past that state when it comes to deep fake videos. And now I would say we're even past stage two, which is democratization, where we have tools available where millions of people around the world can create fake videos in limited quantities that would fool others. So you look at face swap technologies and filters that are built into Snapchat and other platforms, and they actually do a pretty good job of being able to match up all of the pixels so that you create something which looks much better than what you would Photoshop on your own. But stage three is what is most worrying, and that's when you can have automation become part of this entire process, where you can have a single individual or a single organization or a single nation state generate a tremendous amount of false or misleading content and disseminate it around the internet. And that's exactly where we are when it comes to many types of text or fake images. So you see that the internet is full of spammy websites that are taking Wikipedia content, that are taking news content, that are taking various forms of content, and they're altering it for the purpose of being able to make money in various forms. In some cases, they're using it to be able to spread malware. If they can come up on your Google searches for the particular keywords that they're containing within their website, then they can potentially force you or fool you into downloading something on your computer, and then they can take over your computer. There are a variety of different reasons that people want to drive traffic to their websites, but using false content in various forms is one of the most compelling ways for them to do so. We're not at that stage yet with fake videos, but 
it's essentially inevitable that we're going to get there. So how do we protect ourselves? How can we actually understand when something is fake? How can we guard against that deception? And how can we guard ourselves against disinformation? We have to expand the way we think about security. And this is something that's been going on in the information security industry for many years now. We're moving past the idea of just thinking about creating locks and creating authentication mechanisms where we'll just assume that if someone has entered the right password that they're the legitimate owner of that account, for instance. We no longer make that assumption. We know that bad guys might have that password, and now we need to look at all of the information that we can get about behavior on that particular account. We would look at how quickly was the password entered? How quickly did those keystrokes register on the keyboard? How did they move the mouse? Did they move the mouse like a human being, or did they move the mouse like a bot? What happened after they logged into the account? Were they performing actions that are consistent with the history of that account? Or are they doing things that are extremely unusual, like adding a payee to a bank account that has never been on that bank account before, particularly a payee that is in a different country? Those are all of the different types of data that we have available. And cybersecurity is now evolving past the idea of just creating what we call uh, a guarded perimeter around web applications and other forms of information systems, and instead looking at all of the data in a format that we call zero trust analysis. And what uh, I draw a lot of inspiration from is that this is a type of problem that we've dealt with successfully in the past. In the mid-2000s, my teams uh, working on click fraud at Google faced a lot of questions and there was a lot of concern in the industry around whether or not click fraud in its very sophisticated forms, particularly using uh, click bots, were, was going to evolve to the point that it would jeopardize the entire online advertising ecosystem and take down Google's business model. But we invested in large-scale machine learning technologies and processes that allowed us to utilize all of the information that was available to us in order to be able to identify when this form of systematic fraud was occurring and protect against it very successfully so that advertisers didn't uh, get uh, defrauded by these types of uh, nefarious cyber criminals. So ultimately what this turns into for all businesses is the need to invest in these types of large-scale data-based systems. It's essentially using good AI to be able to fight against the bad AI. If cyber criminals are going to use very sophisticated means and very advanced forms of technology in order to be able to create compelling and realistic deceptive content and disinformation, and they're going to do that at scale, the only way for us to successfully analyze and classify millions of pieces of content, millions of events, and billions of dollars worth of activity is using large-scale automated systems that rely on data. And this is happening throughout the industry already, and it's going to continue to get more sophisticated in the coming years. So what can we do as individuals? We should always be skeptical. Every single piece of content that you receive, you should ask yourself, where did this come from? Can I verify the source of that content? And we're all increasingly becoming aware of the different forms of scams that are out there, as well as the techniques that scammers use to try and fool us. So companies engage in phishing training. You've probably seen some of this yourself in uh, your organizations. Uh, there are all kinds of public awareness campaigns about, for example, IRS phone scammers who have touched hundreds of thousands of people throughout uh, the United States. There's basically an infinite number of scams, just as many scams as there are ways of doing business online and in the offline world. And you know, if you had been skeptical and verified your sources, uh, you would know that this quote from Thomas Jefferson is itself false because Thomas Jefferson never actually said it. The, the real quote and uh, author uh, is uh, the condition upon which God hath given liberty to man is eternal vigilance, and it was from Irish politician John Philpot Curran. So thank you very much. It's been a delight to be here.
and we have uh, some time for Q&A. We've got microphones set up on both sides here. And um, yeah, we have about uh, 10 minutes. If you could just come to the microphones, uh, then everyone will be able to hear your question. Phenomenal and frightening, but great. <laughs> you're a great presenter and brilliant. So my question is using biology. So we know about retina scanning when you go through with clear, um, maybe some way to use genetics or molecular biology to cut down on some of this, just if you can comment on that. Yeah, you know, biometrics are a great example of uh, a game changer when it comes to uh, security technologies. And uh, the most widely used biometric authentication mechanism in the world is actually what's built into your phone. So uh, we had fingerprint scanners before Touch ID was created by Apple, but it required Apple to build that into the iPhone for millions of people to start using it regularly. And the key distinction that I would make in terms of what those technologies can do versus something like passwords is that you don't have the ability to change your fingerprints or your retina scans. So if someone were to take those fingerprints or those retina scans, put them in a database, and that database were to get breached, now you've got an even bigger security problem than you had before. So there are uh, mechanisms that Apple and others have created so that they're not literally storing your fingerprints or uh, scans of your face, but instead they're storing mathematical representations that can use a changed algorithm over time. So that builds in an added layer of abstraction and security. But the net result of that is that it doesn't replace passwords, but it allows you to enter your passwords a lot less frequently than you did before. So now you can see with Face ID and Touch ID on uh, your phones and similar mechanisms on other mobile devices, you can bypass having to re-enter your password. And so that saves you time in addition to creating a more secure mechanism. And so this is something that we can uh, integrate into other parts of society as well, and uh, th that will definitely improve security while removing friction. So yeah, it's a great example. You, you talked to, oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> oh, please. I'm sorry. Okay, so um, you talked about um, as we create new security in interventions, the, the hackers also then find ways around it. So isn't this basically a race to the bottom and at the end will depend on who has more compute power to be able to do this? That's a great question, and uh, I, I often get uh, the, the question, when are we going to be done with cybersecurity? <laughs> when, when are we going to be able to conclusively win against uh, the cyber criminals? And I think we all know that the answer to that is never. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we're going to lose either. But what it means is that it is a cat and mouse game. It is an arms race. And the advantage that we have on our sides is that we can operate in the light. We can have the support of our governments, we can have the support of our companies, of our various institutions, who can invest the resources that are necessary to be able to stay ahead of what cyber criminals are doing. And I think that in many of the areas that I mentioned, we are able to stay ahead of cyber criminals. In other areas, we're not doing as well. And part of the problem is that we as a society are still learning how different types of technology integrate into our lives. So the idea of social media platforms didn't exist 20 years ago, really. And so as we're using them more and more, now we're thinking about what the secondary and tertiary effects of those are on our lives, and we're thinking about what information do I want to put on those platforms? What do I not want to put on there? And how does this affect the discourse that's available through those networks? And there are big differences uh, between those networks as a result of us using them in different ways. So for example, you look at the discourse on LinkedIn, and it's actually a lot better than the discourse that you see on Twitter. And one of the reasons is because people generally, and I know that there are exceptions to that. There, there are, uh, there's lots of uh, spam that's uh, uh, existing on every single social network uh, out there. But because of the fact that people think when I'm posting something on LinkedIn, my coworkers and my boss are going to see this, that generally enforces a better level of behavior than on Twitter, where for some reason people think that even though they're posting under an account that uh, is using their own name, that nobody that they care about is actually going to see it. 
And so that leads to all kinds of terrible behavior. And I think that uh, uh, you know, what we're going to see over time is that people are going to be more intentional about how they use different platforms. And that's also going to have a balancing effect in terms of where we are relative to disinformation, where we are relative to cyber criminals, and so on. So, yeah, thanks. Yep. Um, I had a bit of a critical question. Uh, you'd made the remark at one point about uh, we need to better gather information on how users interact with web-based applications or applications on our forums, such as you know how we how we click through or who we're connecting with to better identify bot activity and fake fake activity. But to some extent, it sounds like you're advocating for even greater uh, surveillance over what we're doing and how we're doing it. And I'm just wondering to what extent you start to even infringe even more on civil liberties. And I don't necessarily always want you looking over my shoulder, even if it is for yeah. my own good to identify whether I'm, I'm really myself or not. So to what extent do I have the right to opt out? And is, are there other avenues that we can better combat bots without um, infringing on those rights? Thank you. I'm so glad you raised that, because this is an area that I care very deeply about. And there is actually a tension between security and privacy. We see this in all realms of society, not just in technology. And you know, one of the things that uh, one of my colleagues pointed out to me is that uh, many totalitarian societies have low crime rates. But that, that's not what we want to aspire to. What, what we want is to be able to balance those two and figure out, especially using clever technological means, ways that we can collect data that are privacy preserving, but also allow us to be able to uh, guarantee and enhance security. And so, for example, some of the things that I was talking about in terms of looking at the speed of keystrokes, looking at the way that a mouse is moved, those can be collected anonymously. Those don't have to be collected in, in such a way that identifies a particular user. And in fact, you can throw away any identifying markers that would identify a particular user or identity. And I think that that's very important that you want to bake that in to all of your security mechanisms, especially those that are data-based. But fantastic question. Yep. And, and I think question. that this is the last question. Sorry. <laughs> I'll make it good. Uh, so, you know, as I think about the demand, we always want instant gratification nowadays, right? And so even in the financial services sector where I work, everyone's focused on this real-time growth settlement where you'll be able to send money to someone and it actually lands in the account so that you can spend it in seconds. When you think about the surface area, the perimeter, zero trust, are we able to really build in these mechanisms to secure us so that we have immediate security with every transaction instantly? Well. I think that security is also one of those overloaded terms. So when uh, we refer to security in a colloquial sense, I think that often we think of it as binary, that you either have security or you don't. But in fact, when you look at it from a fraud and abuse perspective, I think that you can basically have differing levels of assurance that uh, a, a transaction or an individual or an account is protected. So it's really difficult to have absolute security, but I think that you can definitely have something along that continuum that constantly increases in terms of how much you can uh, uh, provide as assurance for a particular transaction. So for example, what that might look like is if uh, I'm looking at uh, transfers on a bank account that are below $5, and this particular account has a history of transferring below $5 on a regular basis to another account that was previously registered, and this conforms within that historical pattern, then I don't have to introduce a lot of friction in order to be reasonably sure that there isn't a lot of risk associated with approving that transaction for this account completely automatically. So I can have scripts within my banking system that perform that approval. On the other hand, if I have suddenly a million dollar transfer occur to an account that I've never seen before, that's probably when I might want to say, I'm going to hold up that transaction, I'm going to get someone on the phone, and I'm going to probably ask them for multiple forms of identification to ensure that it's really them before I approve that. And that's probably something that they're going to appreciate. They'll probably appreciate that I didn't just automatically have a bot approve that million dollar transfer and then have to clean it up afterwards. And then you, know, you can figure out everything in between, 
what, what are the different rules that you want to apply? And this is one of the great things about using data and machine learning. You can start to infer a lot of those rules. You can start to say, here are a variety of different types of transactions that we're going to approve completely automatically. And you can do the same thing on all kinds of applications. So I think you can strike that balance over time, and we're getting better and better at it. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>